this, this session is more about um, the business of, uh, of work earth mining. Our next speaker is Jim Caravella. He comes with uh, an exemplary, exemplary 25 year background in space development and operations. Instrumental in the launch of over a dozen satellites, he's also been involved in an established new space programs for emerging space nations. He combines system, systems engineering and entrepreneurial drive to, to build long-term infrastructure vision based on term capital, on near-term capital requirements in his role as architect of SEC's program. He also heads SEC's Middle Eastern, European and Russian operations teams. And should we be ready to go? Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I hope you can hear me, everybody. And uh, I'm sorry not to be attending in person. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, sharing a little bit of what we're doing with you. And, uh, and, and hope that adds value to uh, this wonderful event of yours. So uh, I'll assume that some of you have not heard of Shackleton Energy uh, or the Offworld Consortium. And uh, I'll dive in and give you a a good overview and uh, I'm going to speak for about 12 minutes and um, uh, to 15 minutes and hopefully have a, a few minutes for questions and answers. So we're focusing on the moon and the reason we're focusing on the moon is the evidence of raw materials. Well that's all very well but what's the value of those raw materials and what is it for? Those raw materials can serve a market of 10 million people at a value of $250 per kilogram. Now what does that mean, $250 per kilogram? Well, I'll explain. When we're trying to undertake space programs and space projects, we, especially when we're talking about deep space projects beyond geostationary orbit, it's vitally important to understand the value proposition of what we're trying to do and what are the markets we're trying to serve because it's only under uh, by addressing markets themselves that we obtain the anchor tenants to enable us to actually perform what we want to do so we may dream of building cities on mars or flying around jupiter or mining asteroids in the asteroid belt or near earth asteroids but to be honest unless we have <coughs> have an anchor customer that enables us to build the preliminary infrastructure that we need to go out forth and do other things, we're going to be perpetually in this multi-decadal trap. We're like in a honey trap, stuck around Earth's gravity well. And we need to break free of that. So the way we break free of that is by finding an anchor customer that has capital and a reason and need. Our anchor customer is human civilization. Today we're using about 17 terawatts of power. Uh, by mid to end century, that may double or triple to over 50 terawatts of power consumption. That means the entire two, 300 years of industrialized power stations that we built on Earth will be dwarfed by the power generation that we need to undertake uh, in the coming decades. With renewables, such as ground-based solar and wind power, the challenge is that you don't have uh, something called base loading sufficiently. Base loading is constant power. And we can't build billions of batteries to power the entire Earth. So what we do at the moment is we use coal, natural gas, oil, and we are trying to support and provide our energy needs through the uh, expansion of hydrocarbons. Now, there are some people who would say population is going to increase, and with that, uh, as you can see in green, the energy consumption or power consumption will also increase. You can choose to believe it or not, uh, look at the data or not, and come to your own decisions. In the same way, there are those that model uh, the carbon that has been released from those fossil fuels and correlates that to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so you can see in white the estimates of carbon that has been uh, sequestered from the ground 
and in blue the corresponding carbon dioxide growth. Again, there are those that choose to believe the data and those that choose not to. There are valid arguments on both sides of uh, the point of view. Equally, there are those that would say, well, if you look at a uh, mapping of carbon dioxide released into the air, you also see a corresponding temperature rise. Now, again, the data is there. One can choose to uh, believe the data or come up with other very reasonable uh, scenarios of why those effects occur. One thing we do know is that if those if that temperature rises a few degrees, we are facing uh, significant environmental effects this century, uh, both in macro level, sea level, um, uh, and other environmental effects, and a onset of potential extinctions uh, increasing with increasing temperature rise. Now, all we're doing at, with the Off World Consortium is trying to address the global energy problem. Whether uh, you as an individual subscribe to any of these consequential scenarios or not um, is a matter of uh, rational decision. But in order for us to imagine that it is not worth trying to address the global energy requirement, you would have to disbelieve all three of these uh, scenarios and consequential systems. You would have to disbelieve all three groups, uh, either claiming uh, environmental changes, uh, a limitation to uh, peak resources, or the fact that energy consumption is not going to increase. The chances of all three uh, sets of data being wholly and completely wrong is quite minimal. So let's assume, uh, being a good species that undertakes backup plans, that we do believe the data. And in fact, the G7 leaders uh, of the major seven nations announced in June that the elimination of fossil fuels by 2100. Again, it's a political um, uh, posturing to some extent perhaps, but the fact that this was made was quite significant. And the solutions, as I said today, involve uh, ground-based renewables. The challenges uh, with base loading, day-night cycles, cloud cover, um, ground-based solar power has certain impracticalities, has certain advantages for local and regional power solutions. But the more you try and scale up, the more those limitations uh, start to constrain your solution set. But imagine if you put these solar farms in space. In space, we have 1.4 kilowatts per square meter of unfettered sunlight uh, at a 90 degree incidence falling on those uh, photovoltaics. That allows us um, between 10 to 40 times the amount of power collected uh, at, for ground-based solar, depending on uh, elevation, incident angle, nighttime, day-night, weather, and other factors. This means that we can create a very efficient system in space, it would be extremely large, that could power uh, 10 billion people, use excess nighttime power because it's constantly on, so we can use that nighttime power for freshwater desalinization or seawater desalinization to solve the freshwater problem. And then with that grid of space power stations, you've also got um, the ability to increase communications by several orders of magnitude. And this is really wonderful, except of course this isn't going to happen uh, when you consider that uh, basic costs of getting into geostationary orbit are around $30,000 per kilogram. It's expensive stuff. If you were just to do a linear, simple linear extrapolation uh, without any engineering learning curves, uh, we're, we're looking in the tens of trillions of dollars for a substantive power system. Well, even if, even if launch costs were reduced to zero, the challenge is we cannot launch millions of tons of material from the surface of the Earth up into space. We would ruin uh, our um, environment 
Earth systems, our atmosphere, we would blast through our carbon budget just trying to solve uh, for energy and fresh water. When the pilgrims moved from Europe to uh, the New World or they traveled to Australia or other locations, they didn't bring all of the wood they needed to build their houses and towns with them. They used the local resources. That's the way it's always been and that's the way it's going to be. On the lunar surface, we have at the polar regions, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, about a billion tons estimated of water ice in the cold traps of the southern polar craters and over 600 million tons of water ice in the cold traps of the northern polar craters. In addition to that, there are other volatiles. There are an abundance of minerals and materials. They are energetically uh, heavily bonded to oxygen, so there's a lot of oxides, but there are sulfides as well um, uh, in, in the lunar regolith. So we, we have an opportunity for creating fuel and minerals. Fuel being lots of hydrogen out of water. From that, we can build um, a power system uh, and a power station uh, architecture. And this is probably one of the most important architectural economic slides this century, you know, in my view. Getting to geostationary orbit today by conventional means costs us around $30,000 a kilogram plus or minus, depending on launch vehicles. With a full architecture of power stations, uh, excuse me, fuel stations in space, propellant depots, accessing propellant from the lunar surface, we can get back from the moon to geostationary orbit for a transportation cost of $250 per kilogram at the start of an amortized program operations. That means once you start building facilities on the moon with the massive structures being fabricated out of lunar materials, we can uh, assemble those systems in L1 and deploy to geostationary orbit. And in that way, we can ensure that the value of the moon allows us to get to geostationary orbit for $250 per kilogram. We'll undertake this over three main architectural programs, all concurrently starting, but the main scaling phases uh, coming in sequence. Uh, we're bringing online first a series of propellant depots and transport systems uh, around low Earth orbit L1 and on the lunar surface, followed by a, a full mining and manufacturing system on the lunar surface, uh, and then the building towards the end of the century uh, from around 2040s onwards to the end of the century, a full space-based solar power uh, architecture uh, around the Earth. This is a significant undertaking, rolling into the hundreds of billions of dollars. But one must consider this. Again, the anchor client is the human race. Today we spend over $7 trillion a year collectively on energy. We spend tens of billions of dollars per year on energy, new energy infrastructure. There is the budget for this. We already spend this capital. We're already expecting to spend this money. All we need to do is to ensure that we can supply into the grid for under 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and our estimates show that we can do that. And we've been working on this program for many years now, well over a decade, focusing on program one. Uh, 20 years in the making of over 4,000 man years of experience on the team. And we have covered and built robotics, uh, power systems, uh, uh, robotic control, uh, supervised auto autonomous systems, life support, and a number of other key technologies that enable us to make a start on building this program. We also have many uh, partners in the consortium, a number of the companies we all know, uh, and a number of countries coming on board as well. With this lunar supply chain, we are then able to build a fleet of vehicles that are modular, interchangeable, and allow us to operate uh, cheaply in space, uh, as we would drive trucks across any interstate highways, and then build these large-scale solar power stations in space, forming a new type of organization called the Off-World Consortium, 
that will have a centralized off-world fund administered by uh, one of the major world's development banks, a series of off-world councils and developers that allow this integrated system to occur. And this is based initially on the ComSat Intelsat model of uh, global governance. So by launching the off-world consortium, <coughs> building a foundation to start the early stage technologies off, we can create the vehicles, uh, the systems in space on a modular, multi-contracted basis for a number, from a number of uh, companies and suppliers uh, across the world as we build lunar facilities and operations, expand that out into manufacturing so that we can build infrastructure in space and actually have the power systems to serve a vital and critical need uh, on Earth today. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. One question. One there. Uh, power transmission. Just, 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 just repeat. Can you describe the power transmission through the atmosphere, please? Can you describe the power transmission through the atmosphere, please? Yes. So effectively, we want uh, uh, transparent power power beaming. Uh, so we're baselining at 2.45 gigahertz. Uh, power beaming with uh, spread power density. So from geostationary orbit to ground-based antennas, we're looking at uh, ground-based diameter footprints of around 5 to 10 kilometers uh, in diameter. They can be over farmland, over water, or any um, uh, non-urban land. The wavelengths of this uh, transmission uh, is 8 to 12 centimeters, so it's non-ionizing. It's friendly to biological systems. Um, it's very safe. Uh, you are adding less than one-fifth the power of surface of normal sunlight at midday. So these are very benign solutions of clean, safe, uh, environmentally friendly energy, uh, just safely being down. And then the beauty of the ground-based rectennas is that you can build these simple or the large structures uh, anywhere where there is not existing infrastructure and they will serve as effectively the local power station and the local power grid to enable new communities to have power and fresh water available to them uh, when it wasn't available before. Okay, um, I can thank Jim once again, thank you.